Hello, and this is Rohan. And yeah, we're gonna be looking at the games that I played um, during the first half of this year. So, this year so far has been pretty alright. It hasn't, it hasn't been too great, it hasn't been too bad, so I guess that's good. Um, and yeah, the games I played too, yeah, that was definitely a part of why this year has been pretty good so far. So yeah, there was one game I wanted to talk about here that I did play Trinity yet, but I don't have on my list, the Surf Free Portal. So, I did do a playthrough of that game on my channel, and it was my first time playing it, so yeah, I decided that it would fit in as a game I played um, in the first half of the year, and yeah, like I said. Um, like I said, during that playthrough, yeah, it was a really, really fun time, and I learned so much of the game from the commenters and stuff, it was um, it was an amazing experience, and yeah, it definitely makes me want to try something like that with another game at some point, where I haven't played it yet, but um, playing it on the channel can give me a good excuse to do so, so yeah, like I said, that was really, really fun, and yeah, it definitely does count as a game that I should definitely talk about in a video like this, but yeah, if you want more details, of course, you can watch, like, the last parts of my playthrough, so yeah, that's probably what I would do. Um, but yeah, on the LPing side too, I also did Shadow Dragon, and yeah, I'm currently doing New Mystery, it's sequel, and yeah, those have been going quite well too, even though, yeah, Shadow Dragon was definitely a lot more unfamiliar with New Mystery is proving quite fun, because I am quite familiar with that, so yeah. And the practicing has been helping out a good amount, so yeah. So yeah, with that out of the way, I think it's time that we now start talking about the actual games on my list. So the first game that I have on my list is Pokemon Pilot. So, the newest generation of Pokemon games, so they are very distinct from Sword and Shield, the games that came previously, because yeah, we have more of an open world to deal with, and of course the Pokemon 2. Which, um, when I first laid eyes on them, when I did that video, they were actually really interesting. So yeah, and using them too proved pretty interesting as well. So yeah, that was pretty great. Um, of course, some people mention this game, the first thing that comes to mind are the bugs and the glitches. And yeah, there were definitely a lot of those, but I didn't really encounter any of them myself, really. My brother has encountered like a couple of bugs and glitches, but it's like the really common ones, like getting stuck falling down or something like that, but yeah. Um, most of my playthrough was like frame drops and stuff, that was the main like technical hiccups that I was encountering. But yeah, apparently the, the um, apparently things have gone better thanks to updates, but yeah. Um, it wasn't a very good first impression. But hey, the gameplay was still quite fun though, when I ignored that, um, because yeah, again, the gameplay felt fresh and unique when compared to Sword and Shield, so I, was, I, so I felt like I was having a lot more fun playing it, which is nice. Um, and yeah, again, the new Pokemon 2 were very fun as well. I did like my team as well, it was pretty powerful. I did pick some pretty strong Pokemon on my team, so yeah. Um, including, you know, still picking the War Type style like I usually do uh, with these kinds of games. Um, but yeah. I guess one thing too that um, made me really enjoy um, Violet was probably um, the story too. The characters feel a lot more interesting this time around um, with their stories and stuff. So yeah, and yeah, the climax of the game definitely felt more interesting with these characters being a lot more interesting as well. So yeah, because yeah, they do have their I don't know, just feel a lot more developed than compared to like Sword and Shield and stuff. So yeah, that's why I quite like. Um, that's one major reason why I liked um, Scarlet and Violet. But anyway, and yeah, the gameplay it's still you know pretty similar and stuff. But our system hasn't really been changed. So yeah, and yeah, of course, Devo Con, Like I keep saying, they are very fun. So very fun to use. Pretty interesting about guns. And yeah, I guess I should also mention like the free like major stories as well. One focuses on the gym battles, the one another one focuses on the evil team, but you do take them out in interesting ways. And their boss fights are pretty interesting. And then there's one where you face off against these Titan Pokemon that allow you to 
and your role for being them is increasing your mobility, which is really interesting. And yeah, definitely makes exploring the world um, much better too, and gives you a lot of sense to go up and see her. I did like the Titans a lot. I thought that was probably one of the most interesting cool ways to like... One of the more interesting cool routes to chase up, and also yeah, the um, bullying increase as well really helps sell it. So yeah. And yeah, I like I can't touch that the elephant out of the game. I think it was pretty well done to be honest. It was pretty good. Not like the most amazing thing I've seen in the world, but hey, it was still pretty serviceable, so I quite liked it. Um The game is gonna be getting some DLC downline. Me and my brother aren't really so sure about it. We didn't get Sword Shows DLC, so I doubt we're gonna be getting this one, but the yeah, Amazon does seem pretty interesting and yeah. If any of you guys do pick it up, let me know what it's like, I guess. <laughs> In that case. They are. Yeah, like I said, I hope this is a sign of good things to come for Pokemon, because, yeah. Like I said, with the story being an improvement and the new Pokemon being quite cool as well, I am looking forward to seeing what happens for the next year. They yeah, are. As a lot of people know, yeah. The yearly releases are probably the reason why we're getting a game that had a lot of bugs like this, but hey. You can't really. Unfortunately, can't really do much about that. It is a shame, but yeah. <laughs> because I am thinking back to another game series that did um, yearly releases and it didn't end very well, so yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> enough of the doom and gloom, I guess, but anyway. Probably, uh, it is probably the least favorite game I've played uh, this year. That's just because the other games I've played, I had so much fun playing. This year has been overall really, really good, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I still have fun playing it, of course. I don't know if I want to do another playthrough, my brother has done another playthrough, I think. But yeah, there are another game that I decided to get this year, I feel like that one is one I'd rather do another playthrough of, so yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, interesting game, and it was interesting to discuss this game a little bit too, so yeah. I like it, I guess. I definitely don't love Scarlet Violet, but yeah, I thought it was alright. Let's move on to the next game then. Next game we'll be looking at is Burnout Revenge. So last year I played Burnout 3 Takedown, and yeah, that was a very, very fun game. One of the most fun arcade recent games out there, one of the best games ever made, probably. Um, so yeah, of course, I really wanted to check out its sequel too, which I did play as a child too, and I did get pretty far as well. And yeah, thanks to PS2 emulation being a lot easier for me now, yeah, I definitely wanted to give Burnout Revenge a try. So, it's very similar to Battle 3 Takedown. The core gameplay aspects are very similar. You still can, you still need to, you know, use boost. You can take down rivals to get more boost. Driving dangerously fills up your boost bar, all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, there's one major new addition that's called traffic checking. Basically, traffic that goes in the same direction as you. Um, as long as it's small traffic, you can ram into it from the back and then use it as like a projectile or a weapon against either more traffic or other rivals. And they did add a new game mode called, um, <coughs> I forget what it's called, but basically um, you, I think it's called Ru um, Rush Hour or something like that. Um, or Traffic Attack actually, that's what it's called. So yeah, in Traffic Attack, yeah, it's all about traffic checking many, many cars to get a very high score. And that was a pretty fun game mode. Decently difficult at the end of the game too. Um, other than that though, it is pretty similar, like some gameplay modes got a few tweaks here and there, but other than that, yeah, it plays pretty similarly. Of course, one major difference though, I could tell as well, are both the physics and also the tracks. So, enemies are a lot harder to take down in Planet Revenge, which does make the gameplay feel maybe not as um, fun in one regard to Planet 3, but yeah. Um, you are fighting. <laughs> Um, your enemies a lot more, so it does have that, so it's kind of a give or take thing. Like, they're hard to take down, but if you are able to take them down though, it is very satisfying. So yeah. The other one is the track design. It has been changed quite a bit. A lot more shortcuts, a lot more big jumps and stuff like that. Which does tie into another new mechanic called the vertical takedown, actually. Uh, basically, yeah, taking down someone from above. You land on top of them and you take it. So yeah. That was a lot of fun too, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that, though, it is a very worthy sequel. Um, 
It plays pretty similarly, so yeah, there's that. Which is a good thing because Burnout 3 played super well. And yeah, there are definitely some minor tweaks here and there. But yeah, they don't really... I wouldn't say they make the game better or worse. It definitely feels like a personal preference thing into what, into what game you prefer. Before, when I was a kid, I probably liked Revenge more because of the traffic tricking. But nowadays, I'm not so sure because both games do have their strong merits, so yeah. It's a hard decision, that one. But yeah. But yeah, though, both games though are amazing though. There's no doubt about that. So yeah. Um, for completing it, I say it was decently difficult to complete, just like Burnout 3. But yeah, it was very fun for I didn't really feel like bored or annoyed playing it, even when I was trying to complete it too. Kind of similar to Burnout 3 in that regard too. Yeah, there was definitely some tough things to complete, but yeah, still lots of fun. So yeah, definitely, again, a very good um, arcade racing game with a lot of adrenaline and stuff. And yeah, it's, it is definitely something I would like to maybe go back to for a quick rush, I guess. But yeah, I guess the other I should mention, yeah, I played the PS2 version with the emulator. Um, it did get a 360 release, but the 360 release, some people actually think that it looks worse than the PS2 version just because of the added effects they added, like the bloom and stuff. So yeah, although it does have slightly more content than the Crash Road, Crash Road has been changed a little bit, like, um, you don't, there aren't any, like, monies or multipliers to pick up when compared to Burnout 3, but, um, but at the same time though, I still thought it was pretty fun too, like, I felt like, I feel like it felt a bit more strategic, I guess, because you had to think more carefully about where you need to crash and where to cause a big mess, so yeah. Um, the running guys also showed off the Burnout Revenge Crash Show in one of their videos. That was a fun one. <laughs> Maybe one to check out after this, I guess. But yeah. Um, but yeah, overall though, Burnout Revenge, yeah, I love that game. I love playing that game. But somehow, it didn't even become my favourite racing game. It very well could have, but then I basically found this new game series that I never played as a child and well I fell in love with it and yeah that's what we're going to be talking about next. Let's talk Tokyo Extreme Racer now. So the first game I played in the series was Tokyo Extreme Racer Drift 2. Um, so yeah I was basically really torn on what racing game I wanted to play next on my PS2 emulator um, early in the year. And then I decided, let me give this one a go. Um, Tokyo Extreme Racer Drift 2, obviously. It has a couple of names. In Japan, it's called Kaido Battle Tokyo no Densetsu. And then in Europe, it's called Kaido Racer 2. Because it's the third game in the series, and yeah. Um, <laughs> despite that, though, the names are very confusing. Despite the fact that it's the third game in the series, but anyway, enough about that. So, what is Tokyo Extreme Racer Drift 2 all about? So. It's based on toge racing, basically um, racing in the Japanese mountains, and Japanese mountain roads I should be saying. And yeah, it has, um, you race on a very iconic mountain roads, mainly got popular from the anime initial D, like Arona and Akagi. Um, but there is quite a good variety, and another good thing is too is that the tracks do feel very distinct. Some are more tight and technical, others favor higher speeds and stuff. So it's very interesting to figure out what the best car and subs were for each of the tracks as well. And yeah, during the day two, there are even some short courses too. A new addition to the um, series. This is the third game of the rules, so yeah. Um, and those are pretty fun too. And some of them are kind of too, like Miyogi's son and Kirokamine, stuff like that, <laughs> and Usitoke, can't forget about that one too, but anyway. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the gameplay loop, I guess. So basically, during the day, there are sanctioned events, like basically um, legal racing, I guess you could say. Um, you can earn money there, you can also do Chinkana events, Chinkana events are a very good way to grab money, especially once you get the sponsors going, and yeah, during the day you can get sponsors. You can put them on your car and when you do a um, when you do any of the daytime races, you'll get extra money from those sponsors. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Then the nighttime. The nighttime is quite different. You need to bet the money. You need to bet money in order to race against the rivals there. 
Um, he needs to defeat a lot of rivals to make a slasher appear for each of the courses. The slasher is basically a boss, and then once he's defeated though, you can move on. But to fully conquer the course though, um, for most of them, you also need to beat a 13th Devil member and a Kingdom 12 member. And yeah, that basically, once you beat those, you know you're basically done with the, um, you know you're basically done with the course. Some um, courses don't have a, they don't have a Kingdom 12 or 13 Devil member, like the first two don't. But yeah, most of them, <laughs> after that, don't most of them do. And yeah, I did like fighting them though. Kingdom 12 and 13 Devils, because yeah, even though they're not very hard, um, especially on the um, earlier courses in the game because they're more time technical, it's still pretty fun to take out because they are kind of like the major antagonists. And yeah, it is definitely fun to beat them down and basically save each of the courses, I guess you could say, um, because they are trying to take over both of them, in fact. It looked like Kingdom 12 was supposed to help you against the 13 Devils, but in actuality, they want to take over everything as well. Yeah, that actually kind of ties into another thing that I think makes Tokyo Extreme Racing 2 my favorite game I played this year, the immersion. I really felt immersed in this world of um, Japanese mountain racing. Um, because, I don't know, I really felt like I was there driving my Mitsubishi FTO um, against all these powerful opponents and coming out on top over them. Although, I guess another reason why is the BBS as well. Basically, you can... It's basically a message board. You can listen to what people are talking about too. It really adds to the how immersive the world is. And yeah, I never felt this immersed playing any other game, to be honest. It's incredible, to be honest. So yeah, I love um, Tokyo Shiro Zutra 2 as well. And then the final thing that I think I really like too is the huge car roster. Um, there's a lot of different cars. It's mostly Japanese cars as you expect, but there's a lot of cars here that you wouldn't see in other racing games too. Not even in Gran Turismo, which was a big surprise to me. And there's even some foreign cars too, which is interesting. Um, yeah, it's a really fun car roster, and yeah, it was really fun to make videos about showing um, those cars too. And I had a lot of fun thinking about creative ways to show them off as well in those replay compilations, so yeah. Yeah, you could tell. This game is one I really fell in love with. It's kind of like the Persona 1 of this year, I guess. The game that I basically came in um, to like really enjoy and then make, made my own, I guess. I don't know. It kind of feels that way. It's probably the game that surprised me the most, I guess you could say, so yeah. Um, Yep, I definitely love Tokyo Extreme Racing 2, and yeah, because I loved it so much, I really wanted to check out the other side of the series. But before we get into that, let's talk about the game that I was that um, came out during while I was playing Tokyo Extreme Racing 2, and also kind of, um, and I used that game to influence my playthrough of that game. <laughs> It'll make sense when I talk about it. So that next game will be Farm Engage. So I already did do um, a my port, so do on that, so I'll keep this brief. So yeah, after I played um, Tokyo Shiro Drift 2, I hopped right into this one. And yeah, because I really like Tokyo Shiro Drift 2, I named um, Alert after one of the 13 devils in that game. Um, I call this Setsuko, and that's the name of the Setsuko Kuroi, aka the Gloomy Angel, but anyway. <laughs> It proved a pretty thing name, but anyway, enough about that. So let's talk a little bit about Farm Engage. So yeah, like I said, in that my fourth video, I really enjoyed playing it. It was a really fun game. I enjoyed my watching my brother play it too. Um, the game just does so many things right, and it is probably my preferred choice for a farm game on the Switch. Even though Free Houses is also pretty good. Um, Fire Engage definitely has its downsides though, like the story not being really good and the characters being kind of strange, but to be honest, they did kind of grow on me, so it's not really a um, problem for me. The art style is great though, um, in my opinion so. Like yeah, the characters just really pop out, and it really makes the game have its own identity, which is really cool as well. So yeah, I definitely, um, I definitely really like what this game looks like as well. And yeah, 
gameplay wise too, I think it I prefer it too. Um, it's more of your traditional farming farming experience as well, which is really nice. But it does have a lot of new features that I really like too. The em the embers proved really fun to use and really fun to build around too. So yeah, in my three playthroughs. Um, I guess I could mention that too. My first playthrough was on the easiest difficulty, normal mode. Then I did a hard mode playthrough for my second playthrough, and then I did another hard mode playthrough for my third playthrough, but it was a DLC. And I guess I could also take this opportunity to talk about that a little bit. The bracelets are cool, but I do think that they kind of break the game balance, which is a little bit of a shame because the game balance before like, you use the DLC was actually really good. Um, I don't know. It, I don't know, it felt like really well done to be honest, I was really impressed by it, but oh well. The DLC does make the game a lot easier now, but that's okay. There are other things that add that make the game a little bit easier, like the world, but oh well. <laughs> and then there's the Phil Xenolog. Um, the story for the Phil Xenolog was pretty interesting because of the characters. Um, the new characters there were pretty well done in my opinion, but the map design was pretty bad, which is a shame because the map design was one of the best things in Farm. Gage's main story. It was really well done, really well thought out, and even the highest difficulties don't feel like complete chores to play. So it's kind of a shame that the Felsima kind of fell flat in that regard. Um, there's just a lot of problems with it, and it's not just because of the map design too. How the how your how the new characters what well, utilize was kind of bad too, like the inventories not being able to add weapons that inventory and power preps and stuff, and then having only level 1 bomb levels too made them really tough to use as well. It wasn't a pleasant experience. And yeah, uh, when I did play it, like, the first time I played it wasn't that bad, because yeah, I had my built up team, it was also the easiest difficulty because I was scared <laughs> after, you know, seeing what my brother had to go through, so yeah. Um, yeah, I was pretty scared. Um, the second time I played, I played it much earlier, gave it more difficulty. It wasn't as brain dead as most people say, because of my limited options, but it's still pretty easy. And in fact, some of the um, guest characters you get kind of actually pull through for me, so that was interesting. Um, but yeah, like I said, I wasn't the biggest fan, to be honest, but the playable characters in the main game were pretty cool, not gonna lie. Um, like the new character stuff. And the new classes too, they were pretty fun to experiment with as well. They're kind of broken to be honest, but hey, um, they're pretty fun to use as well. Um, so yeah, um, I guess I don't really have much else to add because yeah, I already talked about Farm Engage quite a bit in my, my thoughts video, so yeah, I don't really need to add too much more. But yeah, I definitely want to try doing another playthrough in fact. Maybe as a play along, because a certain LP that I watch wants to play for Engage on the channel, on his channel, so yeah, I'll probably play along with that. Probably, we'll see. Um, anyway, let's move on to the next game. Next game we're going to be talking about is Tokyo Extreme Racer 3, a game I have showed off a decent amount already, but yeah, let's talk about it now. So yeah, this game is actually part of the mainline Tokyo Extreme Racer games. Tokyo Extreme Racer Drift 2, which we talked about a little bit ago, is part of basically like a spin-off. It's like a spin-off series, basically. So yeah, the mainline Tokyo Extreme Racer games are known as the Shutoku Battle Games in Japan. Tokyo Extreme Racer 3 there was called Shutoku Battle Zero One. one But anyway, um, it's centered around Japanese highway racing on, well, Japanese highways. For example, the C1 loop in Tokyo, for example, and then the Wanga line, also in Tokyo. That, those are the roads that come to mind. And yeah, the game is going to make you very familiar with those roads, that's a thing, sure. But what makes Tokyo Extreme Racer 3 really cool and unique as well is that there's two other maps. You can go to Osaka um, or Nagyo, or Nagoya. I'm not so sure how you pronounce it, but yeah, Osaka has a good mix of high speed and cornering, but Nagoya, it's a lot of straight to so the Higashi Miha and stuff like that, but yeah. Now, what I really liked about Tokyo Extreme Set 3, well, I guess we'll talk about the gameplay loop first. It's very simple. Basically, in the area that you go to, there's going to be some rivals, 
Um, they're all part of teams, and yeah, once you beat the rivals in the team, a team leader shows up, and then once you conquer the team, you made some progress. Um, once enough teams are beaten, a boss or a boss team is going to show up, and then once you beat them, that probably means that you've conquered the area, or even conquered the whole map. So yeah. The first half game is pretty simple, and yeah, this is also ties into what I really liked about Tokyo Extreme Racer 3. Um, the replayability, because the cool part about the first half of the game is you get to choose where you start. You can either start in Tokyo, Osaka, or Nagoya, and where you start does change a lot. Let's give my two playthrough examples. So my first playthrough, I want to go to Tokyo first, because the car I want to focus on was the Mazda RX-7. Um, and I got the Mazda RX-7 from being the team leader of the Twisted Team. And yeah, they're in Tokyo, so yeah, I want to go to Tokyo first. But then on my next playthrough, and the one I'm showing off, I wanted to focus on the Toyota Celica. Um, so I went to the Goya to beat the team leader of... I forget what it's called. Um, but yeah, the team, I remember that the team leader was called Steel Dinosaur, but yeah, I beat him, and then I unlocked the Toyota Celica. Because yeah, you get... You unlock cars... Um, from being either team leaders or wanderers, and then you can also unlock boss cars too as well, um, which is pretty cool as well. So yeah, it's a very basic gameplay loop, but yeah, you earn money from um, being rivals that you can use that to upgrade your cars. Pretty simple stuff. So yeah, first off, the game is pretty cool. Once you conquered all of Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka, then you go into the second stage of the game where all of the maps open up. Um, Basically, I had to explore the rest of it, and yeah, a lot more teams show up, and also the main um, boss of each of the um, areas shows up. So in um, Osaka, you had to beat Team Dart, and Nagoya, you had to beat D3, or the Three Dragons, and then in Tokyo, you had to beat Jinte, the leader of the, the former leader of the 13 Devils, but yeah. Um, and then once you beat them, you can go on to the last bit of the game, where you had to defeat everyone, including all the Wanderers, to make the final opponent appear. And they're very interesting, especially in Tokyo Extreme Racing 3. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, the driving to VR still pretty good. You do need to fiddle around with the settings of the car, something you also kind of need to do in Tokyo Extreme Racing 2 to get the most out of it, because cars, if you don't do that, the cars are going to be very stiff, heavy, and not very fun to drive. But yeah, once you do fill around with it, it does become quite fun, to be honest, and yeah, I'm happy that, yeah, the TXR games taught me that, yeah, tuning the car is definitely quite important in a racing game, so yeah. I kind of already knew that, I guess, but yeah, it definitely kind of reinforced that, so yeah. So that's quite important. There are definitely a few problems, though, with the TXR games. The AI can be, um, interesting. They can... <laughs> They definitely have pretty stupid acceleration sometimes, making them quite unfair to beat. They are supposed to be like this um, big challenge for you to overcome, but yeah. It can be pretty unfair when they just accelerate off the street and you can't do anything about it. Then there's the other side of the AI, where they're quite stupid um, at points, like ramming into like, walls, other cars, stuff like that. Um, but hey, I guess. I guess it's a good thing that they do show you some mercy from time to time because of how stupid they can be at points. Um, and then there's also, well, Wanderers. So, I don't mind Wanderers too much. Basically what they are is they're teamless rivals, but they generally need you to do something before you, they can value you, but they generally give you a good amount of money. So, for the most part, they're not too bad to spawn, but then there's some that um, take a lot of effort to spawn too. You'd have to do some very specific things. The ones that require a specific car aren't too bad to be honest, as long as there's a good hint for it, which you can look at the information for the Wanderer to get a hint. But yeah, generally you're going to be using a guide. But then there's one big problem with the Wanderers, and it, um, it only applies to two of them, but it is pretty bad. And that is whirlwind fanfare in Osaka, and it's like Butterfly in um, Tokyo. Both of them are basically impossible unless you grind for hours or use a cheating device because 
or cheat codes because they require money, a certain amount of money, but if you're playing the localized versions, they kind of messed up the money for their requirement. Um, they didn't like convert it into dollars because CP in the Japanese version was more like yen, but then they didn't, but then they forgot to convert um, the Wanderers requirement to um, basically like dollars, so then yeah, it becomes very, pretty much impossible to reach those amount unless you use a cheat code for trying to pay me. <laughs> oh, that was bad, but anyway, <laughs> other than that though, um, Tokyo Shrine is a free, definitely very fun, and probably my favorite of the um, Shutoku Balan games because um, the huge variety, thanks to the free maps, and yeah, while the game was tough, it was very satisfying to get through, being all those very impossible routes. And I say it puts up more of a fair chance in the next game, we're going to talk about too, so yeah, that also helps. And yeah, the car roster, once again, is actually really good. Um, I don't think it's as diverse as Tokyo Shrine is a trick too. But there's still a lot of interesting cars here and there. Um, especially some of the 1980s cars, those are pretty interesting too. But yeah, although yeah, less of them are viable now because you need a car with high top speed, otherwise, or an acceleration too, otherwise you're gonna get smoked. But yeah, I guess that's where an engine slot can help once the car reaches a high amount of mileage. But anyway, uh, I say that's a good amount to talk about. We still have some other TSR games to talk about, so yeah, let's move on to those. So the next game we have to talk about is Tokyo Extreme Races Zero, the game that came before Tokyo Extreme Races 3. So I kind of went backwards with this series, which is kind of weird. I played it because I was having problems with the disc of the game that I decided to get for my birthday. And um, and then I also found some guides for Tokyo Extreme Races Zero that really helped make me enjoy playing the game more. It's still a very difficult game though, definitely the hardest game in the series I've played. Um, it plays very similar to Tokyo Extreme Racer 3. It's still another Shutoku battling game, so you fight on the Japanese highways. Although, Tokyo is the only map here. But it's not all of Tokyo though. Um, <coughs> including the Wangan and the, including the Wangan line and the Yokohane line. But anyway. So, yeah, like I said, the gameplay is very similar. You flash your lights at your rivals, battle them, and then... Um, Beat them, cause the team leaders spawn, and once enough team leaders have been in the area, a boss shows up and they can make progress. They are uh, very simple stuff. In this case, the bosses are the 13 devils, and then yeah, once you beat them, um, you can make the leader of the 13 devils appear at the speaking. Then once he's defeated, you get onto the last bit of the game where you had to deal with the 12 zodiacs, um, a rival team to the 13 devils, I guess you could say. Um, and then you beat their leader like Charisma, and then you, uh, you have to defeat the Wanderers, so you can face the last of them. The Wanderers definitely aren't as bad as they are in Tokyo Shimizu Supreme. I've heard some of them are a little bit too speed, and none of them are impossible, which is definitely a good um, change. But anyway. So yeah, this game's very different when it comes to both its difficulty and the driving. So the driving, I say, is fun in its own way. The sense of speed is a lot higher. Um, Especially once the car gets fully upgraded and you get those special parts of the high mileage. Um, yes, the cars can feel quite uh, something. They feel, yeah, they feel like animals when they get fully upgraded like that. And the speeds they can reach is absurd. And it's very interesting to try and handle them through the high speed corners. And yeah, that's what the AI is slow, so you really need to take a watch at that. And yeah, let's go on to the difficulty now. Yeah, the difficulty is quite something in Tokyo Extreme Racer Zero. Basically, any team leader or boss is gonna out-accelerate you no matter what. Um, at the point of the game you're at, so yeah, you have to play, you have to drive very smart. You probably have to lure the opponents into smart locations. Most of them are kind of slow around the C1 area because it has a lot of corners, but yeah. Tough, tough game. It can be a very tough game point, which is why having the guides there really helped. And yeah, like I said, Wanderers, they weren't too bad. Most of them were pretty easy to beat, actually, and spoiling them isn't too bad either. Uh, some of them are a bit annoying, mainly the ones that need high mileage from the car, because unless you stick with your first car, you're probably going to have to grind with the mileage trick. The mileage trick isn't too bad because it's AFK, basically. 
you beat a rival and then you just put your control down and during the um, water pilot section and then you rack up march that way, but yeah, it's very slow though. Um, but yeah, if you do that though, you can also get the special parts for having a covered high mileage. And yeah, those definitely help for the last couple of opponents, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't think I like Tokyo Extreme Racer 0 as much as Tokyo Extreme Racer 3, which I guess makes sense because it is the game that came before. It released very early in the PS2's lifespan, actually. Um, it was 2001, I'm pretty sure, so yeah. Quite an old game at this point. But yeah, still, it was a pretty fun game too. Um, it's still pretty fun as well. It definitely felt very satisfying to conquer this one too. Um, even though, yeah, like I said, I didn't really like the difficulty as much, but... Other than that though, it was pretty fun to take down all those teammates and stuff, and yeah, I definitely felt like I became one with Tokyo once, you know, I conquered that game as well as Tokyo Extreme, Tokyo Extreme Racer 3, so yeah. Um, again, um, I, I do like the games of this series, if you can tell, so yeah. Even though I don't like Tokyo Extreme Racer 0 as much as the other games, it was still a very fun game to play. And yeah, definitely fun to drive as well, because the sense of speed definitely felt really good, so yeah. That's definitely one big positive that, I, prob that Zero has with a 3, but yeah. Overall though, I do think that 3 is the superior game, so yeah. That's just how I feel, but hey, could be a fun game to revisit, maybe, at some point. Let's move on to the next game then. Next up is Trails of Cold Steel 2. So this game definitely needs its own my thoughts so yeah, because, oh boy, do I have a lot to say about this game. <laughs> um, it's definitely a very worthy succeed. A sequel to Cold Steel 1, which I played last year. Um, but yeah, it definitely improves on quite a bit from its prequel, and yeah, continues the story in a very good way. And I say, yeah, overall the story was really well done, actually. There are definitely some hiccups here and there when it comes to the story, but other than that, it was really good, and I say it was a worthy follow up. Um, both in terms of the plot itself and the characters being still pretty good as well. And yeah, the gameplay is still very similar, but it challenges you in new ways, and also the new additions to like Overdrive and stuff are pretty fun as well, so yeah. Um, and yeah, getting to play this game on the new TV as well was pretty fun as well. It looked, it already looked really nice on the old TV, but yeah, on the new TV, yeah, it looked great, so yeah. Um, I definitely quite adored, um, I definitely quite adore, um, Cold Steel 2 a lot, and yeah, I can't wait to try out more games of this series now that we've kind of wrapped up this arc, I guess. Technically there is Cold Steel 3 and 4, but before we play that, I might want to check out the Crossbow games first, but yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I am looking forward to making that video. I still need to script for it, I've had a lot of things on my plate, which is why it hasn't come out yet. I'm gonna hope I can get it done after New Mystery is over, we'll see. Um, but yeah, like I said though, very very fun game, <laughs> very enjoyable, so um, I definitely recommend it to you, but of course, it is a sequel to Cold Steel 1, so I recommend you play Cold Steel 1 first. Preferably on the same console too, because you do get a bonus from Cold Steel 1 for completing it, or having a save file for it, I can't remember which, but yeah. Uh, most trail games are like that from what I remember, so yeah. And yeah, like I said, can't wait to talk more about this game because oh boy, there's a lot of talk about this game, especially a lot of the spoilery stuff, so yeah. Again, we'll save it for that video, so yeah. But yeah, like I said, quick overall thoughts. Fun game, good story, and yeah, I say it improves on Cold Stone quite a bit. So yeah, let's just move on to the next and final game. Our last game for today is going to be Import Tuna Chance, so I had to go through hell and back to get this one working. Um, it's a 360 game, but when I when I wanted to get it, we got the new TV, so I needed to get a HDMI adapter, so I could actually play 360 games on the new TV, and then the disc didn't work, so I needed to go and get that fixed up. It was basically scratched up a lot, so then... I went to the store, they fixed the scratches, and yeah, it worked mostly well, there were a few district errors here and there, but other than that, it worked properly, which was good, because yeah, I definitely want to play this game. Um, 
So in more cheer charge is basically Tokyo support. Yeah, despite the different name, um, it is well a Tokyo Extreme Racing game. I think the only reason why it has a different name is because it was um, published by a different developer, Ubisoft in this case. The other Tokyo Extreme Racing games I've talked about were all published by Crave. Anyway. So yeah, let's talk about Import Cheer Challenge how it plays. Well, the plays like Tokyo Extreme Racing are free, except the there's a lot less content on offer, the game's much shorter, the car list is much smaller, and you only have the C1 loop, the Shinkantra loop, but they do add in the Shinjuku line and the Shibuya line. Um, but there's no Wangan, there's no Yokohane, and yeah, there's definitely no Osaka and Nagoya. So yeah, it's a much smaller game as a result. But there are definitely some advantages though that Import 2 Trench has. Um, I feel like the customization is actually even better. The smaller car list definitely helped with that, but yeah, you can customize a lot more and it feels a lot easier to customize as well when compared to Tokyo Shoes of Free. So that's very nice. Um, and then there's of course how the game plays. So it feels a lot more forgiving. Um, when compared to the other games, the game is a lot easier. One thing I didn't really talk about with Tokyo Extreme is a 3 and Tokyo Extreme is a 0 is that you have to be careful, you have to be mindful of your car's condition. You need to keep an eye on that oil temperature, well in TXR 3's case. And then in, I think in both games though you do need to be careful of the tire wear as well. Um, in import cheer challenge though, it doesn't feel like engine wear and tire wear are a thing at all. So yeah, it's very easy to get very high wind streaks, which I did. My highest wind streak was a 30 in one day, so yeah, that was pretty impressive stuff. Um, but yeah, I felt like also the driving was a little bit more forgiving too. Um, I don't know if it's because of how I tuned the car or not, but yeah, it feels a little bit easier to control when compared to um, the other games. It feels easier to go faster compared to your opponents, so yeah, that's definitely nice. It also probably helped that the Toyota Supra I was driving too is one of the best cars in the game, so yeah, that definitely helps. Um, but yeah, the gameplay, what you need to do though is very similar though. Again, you have teams, you beat those teams with the team leader up here, and then yeah, once you beat enough teams, a boss shows up, and then yeah, once the boss is defeated, you can move on. But there are a few differences though with the progression. Uh, because Tokyo is the only map, they split up the teams into three um, times a day basically. There are some teams that only appear in the midnight, some that only appear during night. I think it's night, midnight, and daybreak. And yeah, different teams show up at different places, so at different times. So yeah, and there's normally a boss for each of the um, days, especially in the beginning. So yeah. Um, that's one major change to the progression button that, yeah, it plays very similarly. Um, but yeah, there are definitely some other nice changes too. There's more, there's, I feel like more effort was put into the plot of this game. It doesn't feel like just a story about you becoming the best. Instead, there's another story going on, uh, around Iwasaki. Um, AK, okay, I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> I won't spoil it, but yeah, basically, yeah, the plot heavily revolves on Iwasaki and what happened with him. Um, as well as um, another rival who caused a lot of havoc called Snake Eyes, the lead of the Phantom Nine, who appear at around the halfway point, I guess. So yeah. So yeah, like I said, the plot was actually kind of interesting. It's not deep at all, but hey. Um, it was pretty fun to see the characters talking and stuff, especially because, yeah, I knew these characters from other TSR games. Because, yeah, they do like to reuse other characters from other games, and it is pretty fun to see what they get up to in, like, in the different games and stuff, so yeah. Um, and then, yeah, another good change, though, is the Wanderers. They're a lot easier to deal with now. Um, when compared to the other games, yeah, their objectives are very simple. Um, it also ties into another mechanic that I talk about, like the, um, like Tokyo Experience of Drift 2 actually. Um, at the, at the parking areas you can actually change people there, and some Wanderers are there too, and you can even get info on the Wanderers there too, to give you hints on how to beat them, see that's nice as well. 
There's a lot of nice things to just make this game a lot more forgiving and much better for first time players. But the game does get quite difficult with its final secret boss. But other than that, go other than that, though, the game was pretty easy. Once I got my um, Twitter Super, I didn't lose until that secret final boss, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, like I said, the game is quite easy. But that's a good thing, obviously. Makes the game a lot more approachable and stuff. And yeah. Despite the lack of content though, I say it's still a very worthy successor to Tokyo Extreme Racer 3. They are yeah, probably not as good though, because yeah, Tokyo Extreme Racer 3 being so rich in content made it a lot more replayable as well. So yeah. But still though, I don't regret putting in all that blood, sweat, and tears to get ITC um, working on that new TV and also getting the disc working and stuff, so yeah. And I don't regret getting it for my birthday either, so yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that. Let's go on to some closing thoughts. So yeah, overall, it was mostly racing games this time, but the main reason why I was, I didn't mention it, was because farming Gage. I did multiple playthroughs of that, and Codsteel 2 was a very long playthrough, so yeah. That's basically the only RPGs I had time to play um, for most of the year so far. And yeah, we'll see what I decide to get later in the year as well. Um, at the moment, I'm playing Advanced Wars 2, the original Advanced Wars 2, so yeah, we'll be talking about that in the next half of the next video. I talk about the second half of the year. Um, and yeah, that's really it. Um, there are definitely some other games in my mind too that I want to play. Mostly more racing games on the PS2, I guess. Um, I want to finish Grand Chester 3. It's going to be quite the long game to beat because of some of the later events. I also want to try Grand Chester 4 too because, yeah. Game that game finally running again is the victory come true, so yeah. I definitely want to go back and relive all the nostalgia of that game, so yeah. Um, other than that though, not so sure what games I want to get later in the year because yeah, the Direct definitely threw a little bit of a wrench. Uh, because of that Mario RPG remake, but I think the main game I definitely want to get in the next half of the year is... Um, well, maybe for Christmas too is Trails from Zero, because yeah, I want to try um, the crossbow games, so yeah. I definitely want to give that game a little bit of a go as well, so yeah. Those are just some games that I'm going to find in the next half of the year. And yeah, we'll see what games I decide to play on the channel next half of the year. Um, I know they've got some ideas swirling around here and there, so yeah, that should be interesting. But yeah, I, I hope that this year, this first half of the year wasn't too bad, and yeah, here's hoping that the next half of the year goes better, so yeah. Next time, um, I'll continue FE12, um, that'll be the next episode I upload, and then yeah, we'll go on from there, so yeah, look forward to that, and I'll see you guys again.